Greetings, students, and welcome to the Library of Monsters. Summer is almost upon us, and you know what that means. Big, giant movies with overblown special effects and explosions. Everything a grown man or woman could ever really want. Where am I going with all this, you might ask? Well, before I got sidetracked, my point was about the summer blockbuster movies. There's at least one or two every year, and honestly, they can be very enjoyable movies. Uh, for the most part. The little movie that could, Jaws, from 1978, pretty much coined the term blockbuster. It made over $100 million and was praised by both audiences and critics alike, and is a film that also put a man by the name of Steven Spielberg on the map. The man would have a string of blockbusters throughout his career, and while movies like Jaws and E.T. might be the most cherished of his works, it is a certain movie about dinosaurs that he made in 1993 that had kids like me in those theater seats. It was my generation's equivalent to King Kong. It was big and flashy, great characters, and really awesome action sequences and music. And above all, it had dinosaurs. You have to give me a break. I was 10 years old at the time. Dinosaurs were my life. I wanted to be a paleontologist growing up, like every little kid. I wanted to know everything there was to know about these extinct reptiles. Now we got a new movie in the series, Jurassic World, and it's looking to shape up to be bigger than the first film. Tons of action good actors, and above all, tons of new dinosaurs. What could you love more than that? But that got me thinking. What sort of dinosaur movies were kicking around at the time that my father was around my age? There was actually a couple of choices here, but I opted to choose one that I grew up watching a ton when I was a kid as well. It was one of my first VHS tapes my parents had bought for me. And in that movie, and the two dinosaurs in that film, we'll be discussing today's retrospect. Yes, it's a two-for-one deal in today's chapter. So buckle up and put on those thinking caps, because we're about to dive into the scaly beasties that terrorize an entire island of people. Welcome to Dinosaurus from 1960. Dinosaurus, notwithstanding of using a made-up word for a movie title, is a fun little flick that features a very outdated-looking brontosaurus and a tyrannosaurus rex in the leading roles of the monsters. Their history is a pretty cut and dry when it comes to the overly simplistic story that evolves from the film itself. It was done for kids, after all. The dinosaurs are discovered at the bottom of the ocean when a powerful set of underwater mines are detonated. Their bodies were found in a newly opened crevice that apparently is filled with ice-cold water? Because, you know, Ice, freezing, cryogenics. Yeah, this is about as much science as your average episode of Futurama. It's an outdated plot device now, but for the time, it was sort of new and kind of inventive, so it's sort of hard to hold the idea against them. The people of the island and their great judgment hauled the twin behemoths up from the depths and left their carcasses on the beach while they went to have a little party. And they sought to leave a pretty old drunk guy in charge of watching over the prehistoric creatures. Yeah, just slap a red shirt on this guy and call him crewman number five, because this is a monster movie and there has to be a body count based on the kills from uninteresting stock characters. A storm just by chance happens to take place that very night because, you know, go with it, and lightning begins to strike the monsters, and in true Dr. Frankenstein fashion, the thunder lizards are awakened and begin to move about the land. Thankfully, the brontosaurus woke first and got the hell out of there, because I imagine if the old T-Rex woke up first, then we wouldn't be here talking about two dinosaurs in the film. I'm sure he would have chowed down on a prone herbivore without a second thought. Breakfast of bed, anyone? Jokes aside though, what follows next is an odd hodgepodge of both humor and horror. The T-Rex devours the drunk guy in grisly fashion, I might add. He then proceeds to trample across the rest of the island, striking him out of the darkness like some 80s serial killer. And that's a pretty good assessment that I'll elaborate further on here in a minute. The Tyrannosaurus destroys a bus, gobbles up a couple in a jeep, and threatens to eat the hero's beautiful love interest. All in all, a very bad dinosaur. He is the villain and is rightly depicted as that. He kills without mercy and is unrelenting with his hunger. Even the Brontosaurus is not safe from him, as the two clash several times in the film. The final meeting, of course, resulted in the death of the gentle herbivore. The humans try to make one last stand at an old fort, but the plucky little carnivore will not be denied his food. He attempts to storm the armor facility, but is soon greeted by the hero in the film's climax. Like Ripley in the second Aliens film, our hero, Bart Thompson, gets into a giant machine to battle the monster. In this version, it's a big crane. Not as cool as a giant robot, I admit. The two battle it out with some really dramatic music playing. Honestly, it's a a really solid music score, but it's a kid's movie, so the hero has to win. Bart spins the earth mover around and rabbit punches the dino in the back of the head. The T-Rex loses his balance and tumbles over the side of the cliff that they just so happen to be fighting upon. Hmm. He falls into the ocean, drifting back to sleep in the frozen oceanic waters of his tomb. We know he's still alive because the film ends with a big fat question mark after the end credits. And that's not really that much of a surprise because this is the same director that gave us the fantastic low-budget monster movie The Blob a few years earlier. It's a pretty straightforward history for these characters, and this type of monster movie. Nothing groundbreaking, but it's a tried and true storyboard that does work. Now before we go into the design aspects of these monsters, I think it's best that we address the elephant in the room. or. Rather, 
two elephants. The first one, of course, is the fact that they use the term Brontosaurus. Now, this is a dinosaur that finds its life just filled with controversy. A very complicated one at that. Short story, though, the Brontosaurus was a mix-up of two different animal skeletons. But recent light now says that, in fact, it may have enough differences in its skeleton that it might be its own species. It's a really long history that we just unfortunately do not have the time to dive into this video. So let's just say, for the sake of the movie and the time period in which it was made, the Brontosaurus was a real dinosaur. Just go with it. The other elephant in the room is the very outdated look of the T-Rex. From the 30s to about, let's say the 70s, the T-Rex was depicted as a very upright dinosaur. Its head was wide and its jaws were shaped more like a bear trap. This attribute almost resembled more of a frog. Then the 80s and 90s happened. A more realistic look that resembled more of the animal's bone structure was used in those movies like The Land Before Time, Carnosaur, and of course, Jurassic Park. Its body was more lateral to the ground and its jaws were narrowed, and a brow ridge was added. And now in the 2010s, scientists theorized that the T-Rex might have had feathers. Yeah, I know, kind of hard to picture, isn't it? But they got some pretty solid evidence to form this far-out theory. So, like the Brontosaurus, let the design slide a little bit because of the time period of which it was made. That being said, I love the designs and personalities of these monsters. Mmm, for the most part. Let's start off with the easier of the two combatants, shall we? The Brontosaurus is very solid looking. He has a really nice skin color that helps him stand out from the green trees that he's usually surrounded by in the film. It's weathered and folded flesh that shows signs of wear. It's a good elephantine shape that is only improved upon by an intelligently designed head. Yeah, it's a bit dopey and gentle looking, but you have to remember, this is the good dinosaur. He had to look kind. I mean, for gosh sake, he lets the caveman and the young boy ride around on his back like a horse. Oh. Did I mention there was a caveman in the movie too? Yeah, because those totally lived around the age of the dinosaurs, right? Anyway, it's a plant-eating dino. It's just a glorified giant cow, which is probably why his personality is not all that interesting as well. He comes off very dumb. He just wants to be left alone and eat, that's all. He probably didn't even notice the caveman and boy climb up on him. I mean, they would have been like flies to him. Hardly anything to be afraid of. Now, a giant toothy T-Rex, that's something to be afraid of. And he acts like a gazelle on the African plains. He runs at the sound of a predator. Thing is, he's on an island. He basically ends up running around the entire island at full speed, mind you, because he's terrified of the T-Rex. Yes, folks, this is your hero dinosaur running like a chicken. I mean, the only reason he fought the carnivore was because he got cornered. And he does okay, I guess. He tail whips him a couple times and bites the T-Rex's little hands, but having that long of a neck is just basically asking for trouble. Like a front lock guillotine in the UFC, the T-Rex latches onto the brontosaurus and forces it to the ground. But before he can finish the job, he runs off to chase some humans that would try to interfere with his fight. Old Sharptooth, though, is hot on his heels and chasing him into the world's largest quicksand pit ever. The Brontosaurus is so full of fright that he continues to move into the shifting mud, and in minutes, he's already gone, completely taken beneath the charcoal sludge, leaving a very hungry dino in his passing. Now the Tyrannosaurus Rex of this film is almost the complete opposite of his co-star. His design, outdated as it is, is fantastic. The puppetry work is so nicely detailed for the monster. He had the same folded and muscled flesh that is used in the Brontosaurus, though with here, you also have the nice detail of bumps that align the creature's back. The face is simply amazing. Amazing. It's toothy and dripping with saliva, constantly gnashing and gaping. He is the bad guy. He is the unquestioned horror that could kill every soul on that island. Really, the only drawback for me is the color palette they chose for him. Browns and tans can work, but only if you have a gradient or spectrum with them. He's unfortunately a pretty flat palette. It's pretty uniform. But other than that, it's a solid look that is only accented by a terrific personality they attach to him. It's a child's movie, so when you have a bad guy, you have to go over the top in order to convey that message to your target audience. And the filmmakers do a wonderful job at this. The monster acts much more differently than just a large animal that wants to feed. I mean, he was asleep for a long time and I'm pretty sure he's starved, but there's a scene in the movie that takes this idea of an animal driven by hunger and territory to a much higher level. So let's go back to that bus scene that I mentioned in passing earlier. So the stage is, the bus is driving along the road that is currently being blocked by the tyrant lizard. The driver, instead of trying to plow on through, stops in his tracks. He, along with the rest of the riders, cover in fear when the monster looks in upon them. The scene sort of reminds you from some other 90s dinosaur film, doesn't it, huh? Nevertheless, the lizard attacks the bus and proceeds to stomp a mud hole in the vehicle. And I mean that literally, because the stop motion effects, it looks like the dinosaur is stepping on a Play-Doh car. It's cute and humorous, as well as terrifying at the same time. He doesn't dig through the remains for the humans, though. He never chews on the bus. He just walks away from the killing. This is not an attack for food or territory. This was a flat-out murder. He's already seen humans, both in the ancient times with cavemen and modern-day equivalents. When he peeked in, he saw what was inside, but in 
instead of trying to rip open the car, he just destroys it and leaves. Hell, even animals that kill other creatures in their territory would eat what they slaughter. They just don't go Michael Myers on something and walk off going, haters gonna hate. The entire point of the scene is to convey the turpitude of the animal, allow its image to surpass that of normality, to a realm of devilry. It's an awesome sight that really helps to make this T-Rex stand out from other T-Rexes that are in other films and television shows. Now it is to that part of the show, my favorite segment. Now we get to slap a rating on these two behemoths. Take into account everything that we talked about so far, like the history, design, and personality, I think I'll come up with some pretty fair numbers. However, it was a bit difficult to quantify it in certain spots. First off, let's start with the easier of the two once again, the Brontosaurus. An okay design, but lacking a decent history or personality. It's easy to say this is two and a half stars. While I understand what the monster was supposed to represent, a connection for good that the child in the film is supposed to latch onto, it was executed rather kind of dull. As I said, he acts more like a dumb cow, not typically an animal that people get emotionally attached to. Now that they chose to give him more qualities like that of a dog, now there would be something to latch onto. I could relate to that. It would give him a sense of intelligence as well as loyalty, qualities that a hero is supposed to have. Instead, though, they opt to have it be a dopey farm animal that just wants to eat. It's humdrum, really. Now the Tyrannosaurus is completely a 180 from that, a decent design that is coupled with a rather interesting history and villainous personality. For this guy, I think four and a half stars should do him pretty good. His brother in the movie had an unfulfilled potential. This giant predator, though, was the opposite of that. He embodied the ideas of baneful cruelty. Anyone in his path was nothing more than a future meal to his belly. He was fast and deadly and every bit of a killer that more famous natural monsters like Jaws were. Honestly, the only thing that holds back these two dinos from getting any higher ratings is the stop motion is used to bring them to life in the full body shots. It's okay, but certainly not up to the standards of, say, Ray Harryhausen. But in that defense, no man could ever raise a candle to the quality that man put forth. The animation's okay, just a little quick and stiff at times. So, two and a half stars for the cow-like brontosaurus and four and a half stars for the sociopath T-Rex. While that puts them below the medium average, it's still a pretty good score. As I said before, just because someone ranks that high on the scorecard doesn't really mean they're bad, it just means they lack special qualities that makes them stand out in the crowd. And with that, that is the end of our book here. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and maybe learned a thing here and there. If you liked the video, give a thumbs up below, it'll really help. And if you really like it, tell some of your friends. If you agree or disagree, that's okay. Feel free to write what you think in the comments down below. Tell me what you would have given the monster for a rating and why. For now, this book is finished and the library is closed. Until next time, have fun, stay safe, and I'll see you on the flip side.